to But Are There Dragons, a podcast where two friends pick a book at least one of them has not read and work their way through it a few chapters at a time. I'm your host, Critter. And I'm your host, Jessica. And we're kicking off this adventure with The Hobbit by J.R.R. Tolkien, with me as the resident Lord of the Rings veteran. And me as a Tolkien first-timer. In this, our fifth episode, we're going to discuss chapters 10 through 13. Before we dive in, Jessica, how are you feeling? Um, I will say that I feel a little, a, a little raked over the coals. Like it's, you know, chapters 10 through 13 is a ride. <laughs> Literally, in some, mm. in some ways. All right. So chapter 10, a warm welcome. Let us set the scene because it's been a minute. Bilbo is riding along invisible on a raft made of barrels driven by elves. Eventually, his view opens up, and far away, its dark head in a torn cloud, there loomed the mountain. All alone it rose and looked across the marshes to the forest. The lonely mountain! And Bilbo does not like the look of it at all. Are you looking ahead to the mountain, or more concerned with the dwarves still stuck in the barrels underneath Bilbo? So I was absolutely worried about the dwarves you know we went quite a bit into this chapter before we bothered to find out if they were alive it, we it was it was a little <laughs> disturbing um and also just keeping in mind that we're we're consuming this book in different media the mm -hmm. mountain is capitalized in every instance it's very rarely referred to as the lonely mountain but it is always capitalized like a proper noun and mm -hmm. it is given a lot of traits it is you know looming it is brooding it is mm -hmm. um it's, it's hanging out and scary <laughs> for sure um, and there's also a, a thing that the narrator did right to kick off chapter 10 where they said, then Bilbo saw a sight and a semicolon. And it, it was just this really kind of cute moment after a little bit of a break from the book mm -hmm. where the narrator reminds us that they're, they're, they've kind of got the wheel, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm still here. I'm still here. And here's where we're going. And it was uh, just a super brief, um, it's about to get epic on the mm -hmm. visuals. And, and it did not disappoint. And then proceeds to describe how ominous this mountain is pretty dang ominous so yeah. uh we actually find out here that the forest road they were taking before they left the path was going to be a dead end uh the narrator lets us know that gandalf also found out about this and was planning to wrap up his other business which is still a mystery to come back and find thorin's company are you as intrigued as i am about gandalf's other business I mean, I am, but I'm also a little salty about it because <laughs> Gandalf has already proven he's not going to tell us anything a second before he's ready to. And Fair. I'm just a little salty about it. But I do, <laughs> I did find it interesting that the road that Born, Bjorn had recommended would not have led them there. And that Bilbo had, quote, come in the end by the only road that was any good. <laughs> So I, I thought that that was really lucky. neat, you know, so lucky, very lucky that they got thrown in the river and my bullet right underneath that. Meanwhile, the elves and the men go to Lake Town to feast all in caps. I wrote, he still doesn't know if his friends are even alive. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. So we, we get to Lake Town. It's actually so this is interesting because I don't remember how I pictured it before. I don't remember how it was depicted in the movies, which, by the way, I will be rewatching the movies very yes. soon because I'm so curious. But so it's built on piles of forest trees on the lake. I'm just picturing this like god awful raft, but I know that's not like exactly what it is. Um, <laughs> I mean, but do we know that? I guess we don't for sure know that it's got a wooden bridge running out to it. and. And we also find out that some of the people there remember Thror and Thrain, and they sing songs about the dwarf kings of the mountain and the race of Durin and the dwarves returning and gold flowing in the rivers. So are you expecting a warm welcome for the dwarves, assuming they're alive at this point? <laughs> Uh, I'm not sure what to expect. I think that it's interesting that they are still holding on to these kind of old time songs and stories. Mm -hmm. Um 
I will mention that in this block of reading, I, as I've told you, I, I'm reading on a Kindle. And if you long hold on a, a word, it mm -hmm. will automatically offer you a definition and things. And I accidentally had a long um, press on smog and it um, told me that it had been 171 years since smog had taken the mountain. Okay, that's an amazing fact. I actually thought I wondered this several times based on I have too, who but I don't Google anything later. because I'm trying to be such a good first timer. Yeah. So I don't Google anything. And I actually try not to long press on anything that's a real gonna spoil facet of Tolkien. And I'm <laughs> yeah. like, I know I know who Smaug is. So it was just kind of funny. I was like, 171 years is a pretty long dang time. It is. Uh so I thought that was kind of wild. And I didn't really know what to expect. Um, I thought, I also was very thrown back by the construction of Lake Town. Okay. I, I didn't understand what? the benefit of building your community out on the water. Mm-hmm. But you, but you find out later that there is sure. a benefit. <laughs> I still remained skeptical. Yes, for the uh, I'll moment. I'll just say that for now. Yeah, yeah. And honestly, like, when we find out the bonuses that are involved it's like did they mean for that to be a bonus or was it just an accident anyways we'll we can talk about that later yeah. um but it was lucky that it ends up you know mm -hmm. in the middle of the lake uh so the elves park the barrels bilbo proceeds to set the dwarves assuming they're alive free mm -hmm. this is the description of thorin the first one freed wet straw in a draggled beard so sore and stiff bruised and buffeted that he could hardly stand or stumble onto the shore to lie down with a famished and savage look like a dog that had been chained and forgotten in a kennel for a week i can I, like we talk about this in almost every episode if not every episode but i could see thorin in that mm -hmm. moment like you know exactly what he looked like it's so the pathetic. The poster child for bedraggled. Yeah, just sad. Like, poor guy, honestly. So the thing that really got me through this litany of him uncanning his friends, Bilbo <laughs> basically decanting all of his friends. Yeah. Um, is that, you know, I, I never doubt that he's grateful that they're alive, but for those that are still conscious when he gets them out, mm -hmm. they start to, you know, eventually get more and more grumbly. And Bilbo's response is basically, but did you die? <laughs> <laughs> so yep. I, I feel like we've turned a bit of a corner with Bilbo's confidence. Mm -hmm. um, he's no longer going to be the whipping boy for, yep. for the dwarves. Um, and I'm here for it. Yeah, yeah. Thorne even, after he gets out, he's, he asks Bilbo for next steps. So much mm -hmm. for King Under the Mountain. You, mm -hmm. Mr. Small Burglar Hobbit Man, what do we do next? You know? <laughs> like, also, I feel like I was... I wasn't sure how Thorin was going to react when Bilbo scolded him for complaining. You know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. Thorin can be kind of a turd. Uh, yeah. But he was just like, you're right. <laughs> and then they started unpacking the people. So that right. turned out better than I kind of expected. Um, so Thorin announces himself to the guards of Lake Town with Bilbo, Philly, and Killy at his side. And we find out that Philly and Killy are his nephews, also mm -hmm. of the line of Durin. At least I don't recall that being announced before now. Uh, we talked early on about a lot of the dwarves kind of running together, like not really necessarily distinguishing themselves from one yeah. another. Are you finding them more distinguishable now? I find some of them more. Like, I don't think that we've had any input on Oin or Gloin. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> or Dory, <laughs> or for that matter. Mm-hmm. Okay. So some of them are NPCs still. Yeah. You and know, forever. And that's what happens when your party is that big, I guess. True, true. Um, I did make note of the fact that when Thorin presents himself, now he starts to throw around that king under the mountain title mm -hmm. as he um, shows up to the feast. And for me, that moment was priceless because um, it didn't hit until that moment that, oh, they're about to present and that's where the elves went to feast. Um, mm -hmm. So that was kind of... A lot of times I'm just in the moment, so I'm not thinking about what's coming. Uh, yeah. So that that didn't that realization didn't hit until <laughs> it was spelled out in the book, and I thought yeah. that that was fabulous yeah. to uh, you know kind of torture the raft elves just a little bit. 
just a um, little just a little bit and the only other note i had about this is it's probably the only time i think that thorin's politician-esque style didn't hit funky in the read like mm -hmm. he was coming in with presents and these are my people and this is why we're here and we're here to reclaim our home um so that was the one time that i felt that that wasn't incongruent mm -hmm. that that really fit him like he he was um fully in that role and it seemed appropriate given the circumstance it definitely did, and I feel like if he wouldn't have presented himself with as much flair, you know, um, he got the town going. He got the mm -hmm. entire town just lit up with tales of riches and all this other stuff, and the master of the town was inclined to believe the elves from the rafts that these are just, like, prisoners, these are frauds, whatever, mm -hmm. but he he had no choice but to follow along with public sentiment and just kind mm -hmm. of, like, accept Thorne and his crew as the king under the mountain and just mm -hmm. move on from there and so I, this was our first introduction to the master of the town we'll get to know more about him soon mm -hmm. but yeah thorin's politician side was was very helpful here i think mm -hmm. um also okay so this description made me laugh thorin looked and walked as if his kingdom was already regained and smaug chopped up into little pieces mm -hmm. like i know that this to me, as an adult, when I hear that, I'm like, and kids are supposed to read this? That's so graphic, right? But I guess it's like... Some of it really is. Almost Some of it comical. Is a little... But not comical for me. Like, yeah. This is a sentient being. And you're like, we're just going to dice him up. Like, little, I don't know, little, little bizarre for me. I guess the only thing I would fall back on is my one saving grace would be that Smaug is, in fact, a baddie. You know, like, there's, yeah. there's no... There's no whiff of the story that paints Smaug as redeemable. He is a true villain. True. Not that that makes it okay, but... <laughs> but that's where we're at. Uh, so, given public sentiment, the dwarves, they live it up in Lake Town. Celebrities. Mm -hmm. Looking fondly on Bilbo, even, who was relatively miserable with a bad cold and the knowledge that the mountain and dragon were in front of them rather than behind. Mm -hmm. Would you be Team Dwarf, Party Hardy, or Team Bilbo, like Worry Wart, in this situation? Um, I am still Team Bilbo, one hundred and ten percent. Thank you very much. Uh, the, oh, that's the... actually ironic because I literally have quotes. Thank you very much. <laughs> Just in the books because Bilbo's got a cold. That's so anyway, Keep going. Nice. Sorry. No, just the only, you know, the chapter ends with the only person thoroughly unhappy was Bilbo. And I just can't, uh, you know, can't not say it again that dude's got instincts. I feel like we really shouldn't ignore his instincts. But they had a really nice, you know, two week break. Yep, yep um so yeah speaking to basically the end of the end of the chapter the master secretly thinks the dwarves are frauds but is surprised when thorin's like you know what yeah we should probably we should probably complete our mission so the master hooks them up with plenty of supplies and ponies and they went on their way before we move on to chapter 11 any final thoughts just the pervasive greed associated with the treasure located in the lonely mountain um it's not really framed that way before now, but when we the the when we hear insight into the way the master is thinking about it, I just wrote, "Oh, the greed, ew, gross." Um, because, <laughs> yeah. and, and you know, and it's a theme that continued through this reading. Yeah, it did. It's it's we hear more about the type of greed this treasure causes soon mm -hmm. um okay so chapter 11 on the doorstep <laughs> we're getting close sorry it's exciting so after a few days travel on boat they meet up with the men who had brought their supplies a roundabout way the men decline to stay even one night not at any rate until the stories have come true mm. i like this little bit uh it was easier to believe in the dragon and less easy to believe in thorin in these wild parts says the narrator and they knew that they were drawing near to the end of the, their journey and that it might be a very horrible end so all of these things are just like getting everything's getting exciting everything's getting intense the stakes are super high but it's also really gloomy leading up to the mm -hmm. climax of the book did anything from this whole like journey out to the mountain stand out to you 
Uh, so they talked about no laughter or songs or sound of harp. So, you know, the, the contrast is in the chapter 10. There's mention of all of these songs that really kind of sound like they touch on prophecy almost, right? You know, the king under the mountain will return and the rivers will flow gold, like you mentioned. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's all very lively. And then all it takes is this journey out to the lonely mountain. There's no more music. Um, and the old songs by the lake died away to a plodding gloom is how it was worded. And I mean, that's a crash and down case of reality <laughs> right there. Um, it, the it, other things yeah. about this first part that caught me is he referred, the narrator refers to it as the desolation of the dragon, which gave mm -hmm. me shivers in all the right ways. Mm -hmm. Um I, and then I want to just cut in because I also had that written down, but yeah. like the the particular line that that was in, I thought was a perfect little piece of literary umami, as we call yes. it. It says they were come to the desolation of the dragon, and they were come at the waning of the year. It's just I just got like little baby goosebumps there because it's just mm -hmm. so like oh man, this is you can feel it. It gives you you feel exactly how you're supposed to feel, basically. Thanks, Tolkien, yeah. thanks, narrator. And I I really like that. So. Um, the other thing that happens right in this area, sorry, I'm also, I've got my Kindle on the side too, because I had a lot of highlights. I know it's like, it's, it's funny how that works in certain so passages. So instead of trying to copy them all, I just wanted to see where it was. I could have teed it up. No worries. Um, but the other part that was here, um, there it is, is where... I believe it's Balin who said, there lies all that is left of Dale when they're, they're, they're surveying the area and mm -hmm. seeing, you know, and that was what, you know, the devastation of when Smaug first arrived to the area. And that scene, you know, confirms, I feel like it might've been alluded to earlier in the book. I, I meant to go back and confirm that, but I didn't, mm -hmm. that uh, Balin was with Thorin yes. on the day that Smaug attacked. And that's why they weren't home and that's why they survived. Um, and just that scene, hearing it um, so quietly, but powerfully described by Balin, mm -hmm. at least in my reading voice, um, really just had impact. Really, you know, kind of, I could feel, I could infer the... Um, the sorrow that comes with it that, you know, looking at that and, and probably having flashbacks, right, to seeing all of that devastation occurring real time. Yeah, the loss and the grief. Um, so while they're scouting, essentially, they don't get much out of it, uh, aside mm -hmm. from getting to see Dale and also getting the creeps from crows. There's a ton of crows there. And Balin says they look like the spies of evil. So this reminded me of the Wheel of Time. Mm -hmm. where crows literally are the spies of evil mm -hmm. um, so apologies for putting you on the spot but have you had this experience recognizing something from the hobbit that has showed up in other books you've read and i know <laughs> it's just like think now Do i mean it. i feel like yes but it's a little bit of the egg chicken because a lot of times i'm not sure which came first obviously i know that tolkien came before um Robert Jordan, mm -hmm. but at the same time, that's kind of what I was alluding to in one of our first episodes. Like Tolkien is the landscape; it is so pervasive. There are references to it in just conversation mm -hmm. um, that I think for anyone who's who's a, a, even a little bit of a fantasy fan, you just yeah. kind of take it. You, yeah. you don't even think anything of it. So I'm sure there are references, but. I don't know how often I actually pick up on them. The, it's the bird just... thing is definitely a big deal. <laughs> Lots of birds. Lots this of birds. Last part. <laughs> um, all right. So after a long search, they found where the secret door should have been, but mm -hmm. could not get it to reveal itself or open it for the life of them. It was up a narrow path. Oh, you go ahead. Sorry. I just, before we go up the narrow path, yeah. I had a note about the front entrance because okay. I don't remember the front entrance being described or seen in the cartoon or the movies. Mm -hmm. um, so the front entrance is described as having um, pouring out steam and a dark smoke. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and it just kind of jumped off the page at me. I'm like, it's, it's a smoking hole in the ground. I, I don't remember ever hearing that before. And so that was 
uh, sometimes those uh, differences pop out at me. And that was one of those times. And I was like, that sounds super, super ominous. Super terrible. We don't like it at all. Yeah. Well, there was like also a waterfall or something near the entrance. And so, like, I so had that's time where the start this. of the running river is. And that's, that's why right. there's steam as well as smoke. Right. That makes sense. Okay. Did you, were you, you were saying something else? Oh, I was just also, you know, and then as they're looking for the hidden path, but can't find it, the, the spirit of the dwarves ebb, but, but not Bilbo's, you know, he keeps going, he keeps pondering the runes and their meth- message. And then he's the one that actually finds the path mm-hmm. up to the sacred door. Mm-hmm. So just, I don't know why, but I feel the need to score keep for Bilbo. Like <laughs> that's another one for Bilbo. Yeah. Well, my toxic trait is like, I would be like Bilbo, where it's like, okay, we're all looking for something. I will be the one to find it. <laughs> I will be the one to beat this this map and find it. Just, mm-hmm. you know, because it, it's a good feeling. It's like whenever somebody at your house, you know, your husband perhaps, is looking for something and can't find it for the life of them. And you're like, have you looked here? And that's where it is. That feeling can't be beat. <laughs> it really yes. Is. So Bilbo has, he was riding high, I'm sure, when he found the door. Yep um so let's see they so it's up this narrow path and bomber says he's not gonna he's not gonna do it no way he wouldn't make it up ropes Mm -hmm. couldn't haul him whatever our narrator let us know that the latter wasn't true as we would see how are you and the narrator getting along these days um well you know it was bomber that was making comments about his size not anybody else Mm -hmm. um so i have to kind of walk past that because i'm guilty of that myself uh but yeah, no, narrator just letting us know again, there's more to come. <laughs> and I know uh, it, and you don't. And I know something you don't know. <laughs> yeah, um, I, and I then my point. my literary umami comes right after that, where it says danger brooded in every rock. I'm like, nobody talks like that. <laughs> Except for Tolkien. Except and Tolkien. Me when I'm feeling feisty, like I'm when I'm trying to be <laughs> Tolkien. <laughs> Uh, so, so there's this long, miserable time of no change with the door. Bilbo, though, cracks the code to the song of a thrush cracking a snail's shell. So with the last sliver of light from the setting sun, as a tiny new moon rose, a keyhole appeared in the smooth stone. The dwarves used the key, and they managed to push the door open. At the end of chapter 11, how are you feeling? Uh, good. You know, the thrush knocking with a snail instead of an acorn, which is, you know, minor murder, uh, for (laughs) some reason just felt grosser. I I don't know why. I don't know why I get fixated on these little details, right? But that was the one that stuck out to me. I was like, oh, the poor snail. (laughs) Um, and then, you know, just that Bilbo again is the one who catches on to what's happening, tells mm-hmm. Thorin to get up there with the key. And then the last thing, uh, you know, it was a little ominous, the close of chapter 11, because it said it seemed as if darkness flowed out like a vapor from the hole. Yeah. You know, holes in the sides of mountains aren't exactly our strong suit so far. Not so, so far. Yeah. Are your goblins yeah. coming out? you know are there don't know elves that are going to put you in a prison back there are there trolls you know victims clothes hanging it doesn't yeah. <laughs> no there's actually a dragon and we're no good. good has come of it it's no good but by golly we gotta we gotta move on into it so chapter 12 inside information Thorin makes a speech announcing that it was time for Bilbo to finally perform his assigned task to earn his reward. This made me laugh Mm -hmm. as if he hadn't earned it yet. How did you take Mm -hmm. this whole little sequence? Uh, My comment that I wrote is Bilbo is starting to really have a spine and I dig it. Yeah. Um, and I'm paraphrasing heavily because I'm never going to be able to find it timely. But, you know, basically, if if what you're asking is for me to go down the hallway, then just spit it out. And yeah. I I am living for it. I am absolutely here for him to no longer be a, a dwarven doormat. And I don't mm-hmm. I really. I think you might have made a comment in a previous episode where, you know, some of that might be cultural. Some of that might be how the dwarves themselves behave. Mm-hmm. Um, However, however, <laughs> it's it, still rude. It's very rude. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I'm glad that he's not tolerating it anymore. Um, and I do feel like 
when he pushes back, they go, oh, of course you're right. You know, and I think Mm -hmm. that that's validating that that's not acceptable behavior and that he's requiring more of them. Yeah. Um, And then the other part that I have there is I really love that it was Balin that offered to go with him to check out the super secret scary hallway. Mm -hmm, mm mm-hmm so i I, the literal next thing i said is about balin so he's grown fond of bilbo i've decided balin is the most likable dwarf period that's all so you i was gonna say do you have a favorite dwarf yeah no it would have to be balin which is so well i would say it's so weird but it's really not given you know everything the read has really changed my perception of Thorin to this point, even yeah. though we haven't finished the book yet. It's really changed my perception of him. Um, and we'll wait to see how it ends. But I would say that Thorin, in my very simplistic childlike way, you know, as a kid going into these, Thorin was the hero, the dwarf hero. And dwarf I, king, king under the mountain. Yes, you know, yeah. he's a golden prince of a kind. Um, And that is definitely not my perception having read the books. Yeah, I agree. I'd like, you know, whenever you think about the Peter Jackson movies, Thorin had his moments, but like he was Daddy Thorin. You know, it's kind of hard to like hate him. Yeah, he was still very positively portrayed. And and charismatic. And like, and granted, we see some instances of the charisma here, Mm -hmm. but more often you see him just being a little turd, like a turd Ferguson. You know what I mean? And you and you get and it's not glossed over in the book. It's just like, no, he's calling Bomber fat now and he's threatening him. And now Mm -hmm. he's uh he's complaining i almost cursed mm-hmm. he's complaining at bilbo for this that and the other and bilbo's literally saving him while he's doing this so yeah he's just he's the worst so i guess Valen's the best dwarf mm-hmm. thorin the worst dwarf i, I mean kind as of far as we point, know <laughs> yeah i'd like to reserve judgment until we get to the end but yeah he's probably the biggest disappointment which sounds super harsh to me again i i'm a good vibes girl right like i'm not reading to be mad at anybody but i think that if if anybody it would be thorin well and i i don't think it's a bad thing i don't i don't i also am a positive vibes girly i i prefer to be happy and enjoy things but i also think that it's fun to have like the drama it's fun to have it's just people you know butting heads and whatnot it's because it just it spices things up a little bit. And so it's right. fun to have a protagonist who's not just super relatable like Bilbo or like super friendly like Balin. He's mm-hmm. complicated. And so mm-hmm. I think it's a good thing. I think it makes for a better story that you and I are both like, F this guy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> He's the worst, but also every now and then he redeems himself. And so should i you know should i or should i not i don't know like him that's a really good point you know you can't just have your bad guys be the one with bad behavior traits because first off that's not real life and second off that's incredibly boring to read so that's a really good point i will say that after all that the narrator does go on a little bit of a tangent to reassure us that dwarves aren't all bad Mm -hmm. um they would have done their best to get him out of trouble and then tells us they're calculating and have a great idea of the value of money the quote that sent me, though, was finally, quote, decent enough people if you don't expect too much. I wrote that down, too. I was like, wow. Harsh? I don't know, like, <laughs> sick burn? I don't know what to say to that. So I, the question that I had associated with this was, he gives us this description, finally. Like, mm-hmm. they're not heroes. They're calculating. Some mm-hmm. are tricky and treacherous. Thorin's thought were decent enough. Whatever. Like, did this description change your perception of dwarves at all or did this just kind of check out compared like given what we've seen yeah i feel like this is just a summation of stuff that we've picked up along (laughs) the way to here um if they weren't calculating people they wouldn't be so contractually driven you know and say the contract was kind of you know and, and i don't think that they're truly bad um creatures i think that they you know they're they are self serving to a certain extent which any any person can relate to or they're probably not being 100 percent honest yeah um and but yeah just the decent enough as long as you don't 
me too much from them. Maybe so, maybe it was their maybe it was the okay, if you still think the dwarves are the hero of this story, let me disabuse you. They yes. are not heroes. Bilbo's our hero. Been with me, if you haven't yeah. been with me this far. <laughs> yeah, if you're okay with all the nonsense that Thorin has been getting away with so far like let me just let let me just tell you they're not heroes uh because bilbo's a hero which i think is so fun because he's so little and just people don't take him seriously okay so uh bilbo climbs down the tunnel this is his job he's doing it it gets hotter and hotter and a red glow grew more and more prominent it looks like the dragon is there after all how hilarious would the story have been if the dragon was just not there like treasure where's the dragon <laughs> i don't know yeah. I, don't, I don't know that's crazy um i will <laughs> say that again differences from reading right so the reading gives you the fact that the dragon throws heat that's mm -hmm. not a thing i ever i mean it makes sense right dude makes breathes sense. fire yeah. but had never occurred to it so he's throwing heat enough to heat up the tunnel Mm -hmm. um and and you know he's got like red lights coming out of his eyes these are not <laughs> details i remember from before yeah and don't get me wrong like i feel like smaug in the hobbit movies even though that's not what we're here to talk about but mm -hmm. he was kind of a highlight for those movies because played by Absolutely. benedict cumber dragon like you know incredibly yes. done benedict and... cumber dragon is that what you said <laughs> ever since he was in the hobbit that's what i call him <laughs> yep. even though the hobbit Nope. You know, perfect. Say about it what you will, but yeah, mm -hmm. he's he's Benedict Cumberdragon from now on. He did a great job, and so yeah, I feel like the Andy Circus version of Smog, which we were not getting quite yet, but it it kind of tracked with Benedict Cumberdragon's version of Smog, which is nice. well, we'll talk about it later. But yeah, so we're, we're Bilbo works up the courage to enter the dragon slayer. It's the dragon, and is I fast. do want to take a second on yeah, that. Get in there, just get because in there. this this chapter really felt like the culmination of all that growing up that I was saying that I thought Bilbo had to do this chapter kind of felt like validation of that. So yeah. comments like already, he was a very different Hobbit from the one that run out without a pocket handkerchief from bag Ed long ago. Mm -hmm. And then my favorite quote so far in the book, Ooh, it was at this point that Bilbo stopped going on from there was the bravest thing he ever did. The tremendous things that happened afterwards were as nothing compared to it. He fought the real battle in the tunnel alone before he ever saw the vast danger that lay in wait. And I, like, I just got goosebumps. I do um, too. <laughs> so, again, you can't, I fully believe that you can't be brave if you aren't afraid. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so this was, he knows that what he's going into is probably terrifying beyond imagine, but he's still going to do it anyways. Yeah. So he goes in. It's mm. fast, red and gold, mm -hmm. and fast asleep. As for the treasure, to say that Bilbo's breath was taken away was no description at all. He decided, for some reason, to steal a fancy cup and bail. Just peace out. So how did you feel about this whole sequence, and would you have done the same? Um, I don't know if I would have done the same... I, I'm not as used to being quiet either. I think I'm more on the dwarf end of the decibels <laughs> than the <laughs> hobbit dwarfish end. racket. <laughs> yes. So I think that I'm notoriously noisy. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that I would have felt comfortable stealing the goblet. I understood, you know, even when he said it, you know, I, I was like, oh, I get you. Um, but I don't think I would have made the same choice now. <laughs> Yeah, so I guess dragons know their treasure down to a single cup, so it took like no time at all for Smog to notice that it was missing, and I just think, you know, you would think that going into this, knowing there was a dragon at the end, and Gandalf being there for most of it, they might have, you know, discussed the nature of dragons and realized that that was the case, but instead, Bilbo essentially risks it all for a cup, which... I don't think I would have done. You know, I consider myself pretty, like, a little foolhardy, you know, hashtag Gryffindor or whatever, but I still don't think I would have done that. <laughs> um, it's like, go back, make some plans, and then mm -hmm. move on from there. So Tolkien describes Smog's rage as the rage that is only seen when rich folk that have more than they can enjoy suddenly lose something that they have long had but have never before used or wanted. So by this description alone, I feel like Tolkien and I would have gotten along 
splendidly. So I, I, I feel like we know some things about Tolkien's background, but mm -hmm. I think in his books, he's actually like kind of clear about a lot of like borderline political positions that he has. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like we would be besties. I don't know. What do you think about this? I feel like it's definitely commentary about entitlement, right? Yeah. Um, I don't think that he's necessarily offended by people who are affluent, but people who are affluent and arrogant about it. Okay. I feel like yeah. it very clearly makes a statement. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're well off enough to have these things, you're going to pitch a fit if, you know, a, a never used cup is taken. Right. You know, I felt like it was commentary to that. You know, I, again, I'm trying to be really careful not to Google things. Um, <laughs> Fair. But, you know, there's some material that comes into our Discord where we talk about it and, mm -hmm. and it talks about, you know, one of the one of the articles that was shared by one of your Discord members talks about how uh, Tolkien basically summarily just denied that it was allegory he doesn't believe in allegory and this that the other thing an allegory aside i still think there's some pretty personal views yeah. that are pretty clearly implied or inferred mm -hmm. based on what he's got in here i agree i kind of like it i like i feel like i'm getting to know tolkien by reading yeah. these books as an adult <laughs> as a kid yeah completely over my head wouldn't didn't even clock that at all but now except maybe i was like yeah <laughs> and then i moved on you know but um this is fun it's it's like a little get to know you exercise and i had written a couple of things i had you know the glow of smog i was like that's cool mm -hmm, that's that is very cool. cool um from bilbo it was no words left to express his staggerment yeah. uh and then about smog's rage his rage passes description roaring like thunder underground he sped from his deep lair through its great door out into the huge passages of the mountain palace and up towards the front gate i i, I mean terrifying legitimately <laughs> terrifying <laughs> yeah so everyone's freaking out obviously yeah. when this happens and uh the dwarves are basically like biffer and bomber the ones who are down below guess they're dead yeah they're like fully ready to go into the tunnel without them but then thorin refuses to leave them and directs everyone to throw down ropes and haul them up they all end up in the tunnel safe and well safe in quotes uh mm -hmm. not knowing what else to do bilbo offers to go back down the tunnel as his father used to say for some reason every worm has his weak spot <laughs> were you expecting this no but i suppose i should have because it seems like hobbits have phrases for everything yeah um, now so i shouldn't have i shouldn't have imagined they wouldn't have a phrase for this situation and i will point out that when thorin stepped in to help with getting um bomber and bofor up mm -hmm. that i wrote this is a glimmer of the thorin i thought i knew you know yeah. so that was a moment where Balin, Bilbo, Feely, and Killy had just come back from real danger, and so he told them to stay put and that he would help the other two up. And I was like, this is more in line with who I thought Thorin was. Yeah, that's right. We get glimpses of mm -hmm. that hero that we're expecting, and then he goes back to yeah. his normal self. Which again, probably <laughs> just makes him more realistic, right? It's... Nobody's a hero all the time. It's true. And also, I feel like Bilbo's, this particular saying of Bilbo's just had me like, why does Bilbo's dad, who he, who the narrator has confirmed is a square, why would he yes. have a saying about a dragon? Like, where'd that come from, yeah. sir? Like, I can't remember not, his name his right now. And his dad's not yeah. even the took side of the family. That's what I mean. He's the square. Like, he's the like, mm -mm. So what are we doing uh, with any? Yeah, so we're, I didn't know where that came from. It was just kind of hilarious to me. Mm -hmm. um, so Bilbo goes back to Smog. He goes back to Smog. They have a nice little chat. Bilbo gets to flex his Riddler muscles once again, which I thought was fun. Did anything stand out to you from this exchange? Yes. <laughs> um, so I had highlighted. So there was some of the dialogue here that is represented verbatim in the movie. And I will say that even watching the movie, I loved all of the stuff with Smaug and Bilbo. Loved yes. it. Um, and it does seem that every beat that I loved came from the source material. No big Amazing. surprise. Amazing how and, that works. And I remember watching it going, some of this language 
I don't want to say antiquated, but it's, you know, a little dated. Mm -hmm. Um, So it clearly comes from the book. It's vintage. Um, And they did such a good job of delivering it in a, in a believable way. Mm -hmm. But the ones that I highlighted um, were a couple that I don't think made it into the movie. Clue finder, Mm -hmm. web cutter, stinging fly chosen for the lucky number Mm -hmm. that one i was like what's that what is that one referring to so that they were in a party of 13 oh my god i didn't read i just breezed past that with that because i was like i don't get it (laughs) that's so cute i like that yeah i I like that a lot so those are the ones that i liked um that i don't remember hearing in the movie so i had some that scared me like okay. so can i interrupt so a yeah. few of the things he said scared me he came from the end of a bag i'm over here like if smog has google that doesn't you don't you don't go far from end of a bag to bag end he came mm-hmm. from under the hill which is like there's like under, under hills in the shire what, whatever and so i'm just i just feel like internet sleuths you know in this day and age would be able to find bilbo by those two well, clues I feel alone like identity theft didn't quite mean the I, same thing in middle earth i know but it just you know he's a dragon how like mm-hmm. he could find out some things it made me nervous that's all that's all um so in this in this exchange or did you have more from the like riddling situation not from the riddling no okay so the dragon smaug tries to turn bilbo against the dwarves i thought this was interesting to convince him the dwarves were going to cheat him somehow which has reminded me about how the contract said up to a 114th share because that's the thing that i was like that's not good enough you have to you know you got to guarantee that 114th share um but so like just to jump ahead we can definitely jump back to where the dragon is later bilbo tells the dwarves about about it and thorin's assurances that bilbo would get to pick his 114th share made me feel better about the whole thing how did you how did Mm -hmm. you take this little you know it was smart i think on smog's like side to try and do this yeah so and then the other thing about the smog exchange piece is that uh bilbo found himself to quote have an unaccountable desire seized hold of him to rush out and reveal himself and tell all the truth to smog and apparently it's a thing called dragon spell um mm-hmm. so that's that's a thing i didn't know existed until <laughs> i read the book um so he had this overwhelming desire to to tell smog everything um, but i do have, like th- a bit of a glamour you know yeah. type situation yeah so um I do think that the dragon is desperately clever and so good at um, playing, you know, reading between the lines, making inferences based on, you know, even as clever as Bilbo is, he's not that clever. Um, The dragon is more clever, I guess I should say. Um, But I was actually kind of glad that he brought it back to the dwarves and that the dwarves addressed it in such like a matter of fact way. Like, no, we didn't think anything of it. And of course, we would ensure that you got your share yeah yeah that was helpful and uh, honestly you say that obviously the dragon was more clever than bilbo and true yes because the dragon took barrow rider and ran Mm -hmm. with it as we see later but bilbo managed to convince the dragon to show off his underside you know Mm -hmm. because every worm has his weak spot Mm -hmm. and the dragon revealed his weak spot he's got a weak Mm -hmm. spot on his gem and crescent belly and for me i was like does he i guess he just doesn't know that he's got the weak spot Otherwise, why would he do that? <laughs> was, mm-hmm. That seemed kind of dumb to me. Uh, arrogance again, right? Yeah. Like his yes. crime is arrogance it's more true. than anything. It's um, true. I do. I had to read that two or three times, though, because I was like, wait, did he tell him that he saw a bald spot by his left breast? Or was that just in his head? He said that because I was reading through so fast. Yeah, I was like, oh, tell me you didn't give away the game. But he didn't. He didn't. Um, he didn't. It's fine. And then having to get one last dig in at smog before he leaves <laughs> uh i was like oh i know you're feeling your oats and all but maybe don't piss off the dragon don't. yeah the dragon shoots fire like down yeah. into the tunnel that he's trying to run through and we get a new proverb <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> never laugh at live dragons i can't say that i've ever used that one but maybe i but will. i'd like to yeah maybe i will or you know i don't i hope i don't ever run into a situation that that applies to but i'm sure mm. i will sometime and now i know to use it so bilbo makes his way back up the tunnel with dragon fire at his heels he snaps about an old thrush nearby but mm-hmm. thorin fills him in 
that thrushes are good and magical birds who could communicate with Thorin's people and the people of Dale. So this was convenient. <laughs> did it surprise you, the magical talking birds that are not eagles? It absolutely did. <laughs> yeah. Um but that's okay. You know, I, I think it's just another thing where magic is just casually inserted into a quasi non-magical place, right? Dwarves yeah. are not considered magical per se. Men are not considered magical per se. So, but yeah. there just happens to be magical and long-lived thrushes. Okay. That can talk to people. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Great. Um, so so the party gets to talking about the treasure, and Thorin recalls the Arkenstone of Thrain, a great white gem that the dwarves had found beneath the roots of the mountain. I've got a little literary umami written down. It was like a globe with a thousand facets. It shone like silver in the firelight, like water in the sun, like snow under the stars, like rain upon the moon. It's just so poetic. I nice. love it. Um, so something is telling me also if Bilbo picked this as his one fourteenth share, we'd have a problem. Mm -hmm. Like this this I feel like this is like a little seed of things that are to come. Did did you get any kind of like foreshadowing out of this? Uh yeah, I mean I'm but not you gonna knew, pretend you knew, I didn't yeah. know. I, I did know, but I did feel that the description was um thorough enough to give that foreshadowing vibe this um, is important <laughs> yes please look here yeah he, you hear this thing remember it yes um all right so bilbo's spidey senses go off all of a sudden right and yes. he pleads with thorin to shut the door and thorin obliges just in time for the dragon to obliterate that side of the mm -hmm. mountain trapping them except for the passage of course mm -hmm. down to the dragon's lair then the dragon takes off for lake town seeking revenge against those who helped the barrel rider any mm -hmm. thoughts at the end of chapter 13 just that it was another killer ending they yeah. shall see me and remember who is the real king under the mountain he rose in fire and went away south towards the running river i I mean, that's intense. That's intense. Who's the real king under the mountain? Yeah, it's just, he's so fierce. I love mm -hmm. Smog, honestly. Like, that's why the, the, the imagery of him being chopped up into little pieces makes me sad <laughs> and uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, all right, so chapter 13, not at mm -hmm. home. After waiting in the tunnel for as long as they could stand it, Bilbo perks up. He quotes his dad again, while there's life, there's hope, and third mm -hmm. time pays for all, and he and the dwarves headed down the tunnel, and Smog is not at home. So Bilbo pokes around while the dwarves hang back, and he comes across, lo and behold, the Arkenstone, and pockets it, thinking he'd very much like it as his mm -hmm. 114th. Uh, we kind of already mentioned this. Do you think this is going to cause a problem? <laughs> I do. And I I also wrote in my notes that he rationalizes not telling them kind of like the ring. And, you know, Ooh. his internal monologue was, I must tell the dwarves about it sometime. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Okay. That's such a good point. The, the fact that he even pockets it, it goes in a pocket just like the ring. That mm -hmm. is a really good parallel that I had not drawn. And he makes a couple of comments about I'm not a real burglar. <laughs> except except things fall into my pockets and i forget about them mm. um so the oh you go ahead uh i was just gonna say i i i wrote down that you know the dwarves are gonna sit near the door and they watch bilbo as he took the real risk you know mm -hmm. again kind of chalking it up to you're the burglar this is your job this is you earning your um share so to mm -hmm. speak uh, and then again, um, Balin is the one who steps up and says it's our turn to help, to step down and help Bilbo. So I really love that. Balin's the real MVP here. Yeah, so Bilbo's yes. torch goes out as he's like flailing around, getting getting assaulted by bats <laughs> and whatnot, which is a nightmare because, you know, bats carry yeah. rabies. If you, ever get, yeah. if you ever encounter a rat, PSA, not a rat, a bat, bat. PSA, you got to go get a rabies shot. It's important because those things are nasty. Um, so anyway, so they find uh, they all come out. Finally, they're they're looting the treasure. It's amazing. They find a mithril coat for Bilbo mm -hmm. and Thorin bestows it upon him, which was fun. Mm -hmm. I feel like them finding armor and weapons and instruments and like suiting up. It reminded me a lot of looting in video games or like D&D &D or Diablo. Mm -hmm. Is that the kind of vibe yeah. that you got? Absolutely. Yeah. What kind of swag? 
How much gear? Give Tell me, the me swag. DM. What did I get off of this encounter? <laughs> Literally. And the way they describe the dwarves, Thorin especially, when they're all decked out in all mm-hmm. of their like new armor and gem encrusted mm-hmm. belts and all this other stuff is like, I wish I could actually see that, you know, because it mm-hmm. sounds like it's so majestic and cool. But it's so almost diluted in the moment, right? So, so yes. I love that Bilbo... Um, you know, the narrator tells us point blank, Bilbo is not as um, affected by the horde of mm-hmm. goods as the dwarves are. Um, and he makes a very cute, cozy comment. He'd rather give some of it up for a drink of something cheering out of one of Bjorn's wooden bowls. And I'm just mm-hmm. like, yeah, dude. Um, but he says, you know, my favorite line from here, this treasure is not yet won back. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. They're parading around Yo as guys. if they won it. Yeah. Um. <laughs> hey, hey, so yeah. Okay. I thought so that that was a good reality check. Yeah, Bilbo is the uh, consummate realist. He, he 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 knows. He stays focused where everyone else strays from the path. <laughs> anyway, so uh, Bilbo eventually peels the dwarves away from the treasure, and Thorin leaves them leads them up through the mountain, through the desolated great chamber of Thror, and to the front gate they decide eventually they need to like go somewhere else in case the dragon comes back so they strike out to a watch post where they will be more hidden from the dragon and we mm-hmm. get introduced to the food they've been living off of cram mm-hmm. the narrator lets us know that he doesn't know the recipe but does know that it's biscuitish non-perishable sustaining but not entertaining so i kind of love when we get to bits like this it the wheel of time has honey cakes the stormlight archive has chow ta are you a mm-hmm. fan or is this too much detail for you no, this is great. Um, especially what because I think of something like this, something that is, you know, probably nutritious enough to get you by, but essentially provides no enjoyment. Yeah. <laughs> and and what a torture in and of itself that must be for Bilbo, who, you know, <laughs> whose whole life before now is built around the the enjoyment of culinary delights. So yeah. poor guy. Yeah. He thinks about food so much, by the way. I, he really I, does. I honestly, every time I see it in the book, I'm like, I need to I need to put this in the outline. But then I'm like, but then the outline would be twice as long. Yeah. <laughs> I talk about every time that Bilbo thinks about food or drink or how hungry he is or whatever. Um, so I don't, but I could. I, it's my first instinct. Um, um, there was one other thing that happened at the end of the chapter. Mm -hmm. which is that's when you put it together that they were basically in hiding at the top of the tunnel for two and a half days. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like I'm a broken record and I say it a lot, but there are times where the passage of time is kind of skated over by the movies and stuff. And so the idea of sitting in the dark, silent because you're worried Mm -hmm. for two and a half days before they crept out to investigate just sounds freaking terrible miserable miserable actually Mm -hmm. the worst yeah like i think i recall whenever bilbo was um burgling in the elf caves he said it was like Mm -hmm. the most tiresome version part of the trip and i feel like maybe that two and a half days at the top of Mm -hmm. the dragon tunnel might have beaten it (laughs) maybe just a little it seems Uh, like it would be very harrowing i mean they they were back was up against a wall right that whole part was broken there was nowhere for them to go yeah so yeah yeah so they they set up camp for the night on the way to the watch post and they notice that in the south is a gathering of many birds they don't know what this is did you have a guess at this point um i kind of did uh what was the guess but i wasn't 100 percent sure <laughs> well i i kind of thought that it would be smog's corpse oh. uh, so again because i know because i've seen the movies and stuff i knew that or I, it seemed likely that in this interim mm-hmm. that that is when he went to lake town so, but i wasn't 100 percent sure and okay. i immediately continued reading <laughs> All right, so that's the end of the chapter. Any final thoughts about all of the chapters, this whole sequence for this week? Just it was, you know, it's it's clearly the they're getting close to the end of the line. Mm-hmm. Uh, the stakes are incredibly real. Um, they finally made it to the Lonely Mountain, but how they plan to take it is still very much up in the air. 
Unclear. Yeah, I find it's so interesting that in The Hobbit, the main threat that you think is the main threat, Smog, leaves. They, he leaves who, who we think the main heroes, the main good guys are alone in, in mm. the moment that you think is going to be the climax of, of the movie slash book slash whatever. He's just he's just piecing out Gone. and they're alone. Like, I find that to be so interesting and different from what you expect out of a story. Usually mm -hmm. it's the people you've been following the whole book go to the thing that they've been trying to go to the whole time, fight the big bad, and then there's a resolution. And that's just not exactly how this book is going. <laughs> so it's interesting. Yeah, no, to be fair, most fantasy stories, the heroes that you follow the whole time are the heroes that slay the dragon. That's what I mean. And uh, granted, like, you know, we haven't gotten there yet, but... That's what you would expect. And this book subverts expectations in that way. Which is so funny because it's so foundational to fantasy. And yet, it still subverts what you would like. In this day and age, so many people do the heroes go kill the monster that they've mm -hmm. been chasing. Period. And that's just not how it goes here. But I love the fact that all these years ago in this foundational work, Tolkien introduced a very groovy twist. Yeah. <laughs> You know? <laughs> yeah, that's true. He, whether he knew it or not, he was essentially writing a formula that decades of of creatives would follow for years mm -hmm. to come. Um, and he wrote it with a twist, which is just just yeah. gifts. I don't. I don't need to follow even my own formula. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay, so that's that's it, man. Next mm -hmm. week we're reading chapters fourteen through nineteen. We're finishing the book. Finish the book, the people. book, you guys. Yeah, pretty exciting times. Okay. So this is the part where we say thank you so much for tuning in to episode five of season one of But Are There Dragons? Brought to you by your hosts, me, Jessica Sadai, and Critter XD. Please don't forget to follow us at But Are There Dragons on YouTube, Instagram, and TikTok, and But Dragons Pod with just one T on X, <laughs> formerly known as Twitter. You can also find Critter at Critter XD, Critter with a K, on YouTube, TikTok, and X, and at Critter underscore XD on Instagram. You can find me by searching for self indulgence on TikTok, Instagram, and X. That's it for us today. We're still playing around with catchphrases, so let us know how you feel about this one. Today's is Never Laugh at Live Dragons. <laughs> Thank you and good night. Bye.